So in this uh, third video lesson of this theme, uh, I will then discuss uh, how do we deal with heteroscedasticity if, uh, if we uh, find it in our statistical test or otherwise we believe that there is uh, heteroscedasticity present in our model. So firstly, it's good to remind you about the implications of heteroscedasticity. So recall that uh, the OLS estimator is still unbiased and it's still consistent even if we have some heteroscedasticity. So the problem is not so serious as, a, as the case of endogeneity. Um, we might be able to figure out a more efficient estimator and this is what we will, we will do, do shortly. However, I want to highlight that th this always requires some additional assumptions about heteroscedasticity. So, uh, uh, if we don't know anything about the possible underlying causes of heteroscedasticity or what kind of uh, variable it would, would explain the heteroscedasticity, then uh, a simple remedy might be to do nothing and just rely on the OLS uh, regression. So uh, that's in some sense one, one possibility. However, remember also that uh, the statistical inferences fail because the the um, because the standard errors are not valid if we have heteroscedasticity problem. So in some sense, the simplest way to deal with heteroscedasticity would be to correct for the standard errors and continue to rely on the bias, by this um, point estimates of the OLS. Okay, so in that sense, the, the two, two possible remedies to the heteroscedasticity are indicated here by A or B. So the option A is just that we could still keep using the OLS estimator, however correct for the heteroscedasticity in the standard errors. And uh, I mentioned this Halbert Weiss work uh, already in the testing of heteroscedasticity, but uh, perhaps even more influential part of his work uh, in his 1980 econometrica paper is the, the development of the so-called robust standard errors. So these robust standard errors you might nowadays encounter quite uh, widely and it goes back to this Halbert White's 1980 article. So that's one possibility and uh, if you use for example Stata then it's easy to find in the options to just uh, select the, the robust, uh, uh, robust option and then it, it computes automatically you this uh, robust standard errors. So I will not go in this, uh, this uh, course to the details of uh, what exactly is the definition of robust standard errors. It's important to know that it's just uh, robust against uh, heteroscedasticity of, uh, of any form. Okay, and that's, that's a valid approach if we, if we don't really have any, any good idea what is causing heteroscedasticity, we don't have any good uh, model of heteroscedasticity. Uh, now the Second alternative, this alternative route B, which I will then consider later, is that, uh, okay, if we can actually model heteroscedasticity, then we can have a more efficient estimator. And this refers to then to the so-called generalized least squares approach, uh, uh, where uh, Aitken's 1935 work uh, generalizes the Gauss-Markov theorem to the heteroscedastic case. Okay. So let's start briefly with the, with the option A, and then I will go to the option B later. So I just illustrate you what, what is the, uh, what, what is the uh, application of the robust standard error. So this is just an empirical example using this electricity distribution firm's data with the Cobb Douglas production function. So I have done it with the, with the Stata, but uh, but I believe the robust standard errors you can also find in R or other, other statistical software. Typically software that is, that is uh, uh, familiar to, to uh, economists and econometricians, uh, not necessarily in the, in the software that statisticians are used, because as I mentioned, this uh, robust standard error comes from the uh, economics literature. So uh, here is the same regression model. Uh, um, in the top part of the of the slide, with uh, out uh, with in this blue colored box, uh, we ha I have used this option robust, which is also indicated in this uh, this uh, command line, and uh, the blue box, uh, sorry, red box is then the the standard OLS. Uh, so uh, 
if you continue to use this OLS estimator but uh, but just apply robust standard errors then uh, notice that the coefficients themselves do not really change at all when this option of robust standard errors is used so this ANOVA table is not reported that's one one uh, notable difference in the in this uh, regression output uh, in in stata so notice that uh, then this column standard errors is replaced by robust standard errors but everything is uh, is uh, interpreted and used in the exactly same way as uh, as before so then then notice also that the t statistic uh, changes to some extent because the standard error is different confidence intervals change to some extent in this uh, this particular example there's no change to the p values because they are so small anyway and of course uh, R squared statistic wouldn't change and and so on so the indeed the purpose of the whites uh, heteroscedasticity robust standard errors is to just adjust for the possible uh, heteroscedasticity in the calculation of the standard error so it's just using a different formula for calculating the standard errors and the theoretical property is that it's more robust if there is a heteroscedasticity uh, nowadays, there are also like a couple of alternatives for the, for the robust standard errors, but uh, I hope this example also illustrates that uh, that uh, in some sense it's uh, seducively simple to just continue to rely on the on the OLS regression model despite heteroscedasticity and uh, and just use robust standard errors. Perhaps so much so that uh, that nowadays uh, many empirical economists, applied economists, they, they routinely use the robust standard errors without even testing for the for the heteroscedasticity. So uh, so it seems nowadays many people believe that uh, the robust standard errors is such a such a uh, remedy against the heteroscedasticity that it should be should be always used. However, there there might be in some some applications. Uh, some uh, inefficiency loss because uh, if uh, if the homoscedasticity assumption holds then the the classical standard errors are more efficient than the robust standard errors so so i wouldn't advise to like just uh, just uh, always use the robust standard errors if, even if you don't suspect that there is any heteroscedasticity problem but uh, indeed like i mentioned in empirical work, you often see the robust standard errors just, just used without any, any explanation. So it's also good to understand in that point, point of view that uh, what's the meaning of the, the, why it is robust. It's supposed to be robust against heteroscedasticity. Okay. So what if we then have some, some more, more serious problem with the, with the heteroscedasticity? What if we do this root number B? So then we can resort to the so-called uh, uh, generalized least squares. Uh, I'm, in my impression, this is not so much nowadays uh, used, so it's, it's somehow fallen, fallen a little bit uh, out of popularity, but uh, it's also maybe for a pedagogical point of view, it's good to also consider this one. So firstly, suppose that uh, we know the, exactly the variance of the uh, each error term. So now we have variance, not just constant sigma squared, but it's sigma squared i. So we have, uh, we know exactly what is the variance of uh, the each error term. So the simple remedy would be to then introduce such a weights like a, like a so-called weighted least squares, is sometimes referred to as a solution to the heteroscedasticity problem. And here I have uh, rephrased the uh, uh, OLS problem, but now I have uh, uh, introduce this kind of weights to the to the objective function. So I divide uh, the squared value of the error term epsilon by the by the corresponding variance of that that specific observation. So intuitively, we could assign a, a higher weight to those observations which have a smaller uh, smaller variance of the error term. So if we could do that, then then okay, we can actually still uh, still use the OLS estimator if we have the following kind of uh, kind of data transformation. So we could always then divide all of our data with the standard deviation uh, sigma i, and uh, with this kind of uh, division, then then uh, 
we can still continue to use ordinary least squares estimator. And in that sense, this is referred to as the generalized least squares. When we, when we divide a dependent variable y, we depend, divide each and every x variable, and we even the constant term we divide by the standard deviation sigma i. And this sigma i now differs, of course, across all observations because we have the heteroscedastic case. And uh, indeed, Aitken shows that the, the Gauss-Markov theorem about efficiency of the ordinary least squares estimator can be generalized to this case. So, so this kind of uh, uh, division by standard deviation sigma i helps to maintain the efficiency of the OLS estimator. So that would be equivalent to the to the to the weighted least squares that I had on the on the previous slide. But this is uh, simple because we can we can after this kind of uh, uh, data transformation we can just continue to use ordered least squares. Now here is a little little catch though. I am mentioned that we assume that this sigma squared i or here also sigma i is known but of course uh, that's something that we typically do not know um, in advance and uh, this is why then we have this term feasible generalized least square so it becomes feasible gls uh, uh, when we have some estimate for the standard deviation sigma i and uh, uh, in fact this we cannot uh, estimate from the original original data, we always need some kind of model of heteroscedasticity. So uh, in a typical textbook case, then is to say that, okay, so assume that the sigma i is proportional to one of the explanatory variables. So if we think about, for example, this housing market example we have considered earlier in this course, uh, we could, for example, assume that the standard deviation of the error term, the sigma i would be directly proportionate to the size of the apartment in square meters. So we could, for example, then replace the sigma i by square meters of the apartment. And then, then we could just divide by the square meters each, each variable. Uh, alternatively, if we use the, the, for example, if you use the white test for, for testing heteroscedasticity uh, or, or some other, so here is just one, one example on the on the bottom line of this uh, this uh, slide uh, so we could fit first some regression model to try to predict the the what is the what is the uh, variance of the error term and uh, we might use something that we already had for the testing of heteroscedasticity so in some sense if we run a statistical test of heteroscedasticity and we found their heteroscedasticity so the same auxiliary model we could then also use as a to get the prediction of the heteroscedasticity, which could be then used in the feasible generalized least squares. So this would be then, uh, then uh, potentially more efficient uh, uh, estimator than the classic OLS. However, of course, efficiency of the GLS really now depends on the, the that how well do we capture the heteroscedasticity. So notice that any estimation error in this uh, sigma i squared would then, of course, uh, uh, reduce the efficiency of the feasible generalized least squares. And that is probably the reason why the why this uh, uh, generalized least squares uh, is not so much uh, nowadays used, but, uh, but uh, many practical applications prefer to use the, the white heteroscedasticity robust standard errors and continue to rely on OLS. So that's also perhaps the reason why the Heteroscedasticity is not no longer considered to be such a uh, big issue, and endogeneity is much a, much a bigger bigger issue. Okay, so we will then come back to this. Uh, one of the themes we had uh, in this the, the was the autocorrelation, and I'll briefly come back to that in the in the next theme when we go to the time series econometrics, and I will have some models that. Uh, models for the autocorrelation as well. So time series econometrics is very, very large uh, theme within econometrics. Uh, we devote only one theme, but I will have uh, multiple uh, video lessons related to the time series to, to also reflect the uh, uh, importance and scope of time series in the econometrics literature. See you on the next uh, video then. Bye bye.